Hello from National Geographic Education. My name is Vivette Dukes and this is Explorer Classroom. At National Geographic, we use the power of science, exploration, education, and storytelling to illuminate and protect the wonder of our world. Explorer Classroom connects students worldwide with our National Geographic Explorers for short lessons and time for your questions. This school year, each month will be organized around a specific theme. This November, Explorer Classroom will be exploring the importance of learning from the past. Today, our explorer is Lisa Briggs. Lisa is an underwater archeologist, scuba instructor, and technical diver whose current research examines ancient shipwrecks of the Mediterranean Sea. That is so cool, Lisa. Today, she's going to help us learn more about the cargoes these ships carried and the daring sailors who piled and plied and searched the seas in the past. Wow, I can't wait to learn all about them. But before we go into today's lesson, I'd like to welcome our registered viewers who join us from around the globe. Special shout out goes to Anna L. Klein Elementary School, Higgins Middle School, shout out, Lancers International School, hi there, CompStat School, Berman School, and all our home schools out there. Thank you so much for joining us. We're thrilled to have you all here. And with that, let's get this Explorer Classroom started. It's time to turn it over to Lisa to share all about underwater archeology. span Take it away, Lisa. Thank you so much, Vivette. I am delighted to be here and share with you guys my love for ancient shipwrecks and scientific research. Let me show you what I do. So today we're gonna to be talking about ancient shipwrecks and scientific research that we do on them to help learn lessons from the past. I'm gonna set you guys up with a cool video next. Sorry, just have to advance my slide. Okay, I'm gonna show you a little uh, video. Have you ever played tug of war with an octopus or seen an eel slither out of an ancient amphora? This is the world of underwater archeology. span and today, we are all going to get a glimpse of this world. So take a deep breath and join me as we go diving for DNA in the watery world of ancient shipwrecks. On my first scuba dive, I was terrified. And I looked ridiculous, but it's okay. Everyone looks ridiculous in scuba gear. But I was so fascinated by the underwater world that I became an underwater archeologist and now I study ancient shipwrecks and the cargo they carried around the globe. Two thirds of our planet is covered in water and the majority of ancient shipwrecks have not yet been found. Shipwrecks tell us about trade, exploration and how people were connected in the ancient world. Shipwrecks are also alive. They create artificial reefs where juvenile fish can safely hide. And this menacing eel can give me dirty looks. My project, Diving for DNA, analyzes the DNA we can extract from cargo items on ancient shipwrecks, including olive stones and grape seeds. These are 2,000 year old grape seeds from a Roman site in Croatia. We 
We collect these cargo items and analyze their DNA in our laboratories in Oxford. This way, we can understand how these grape seeds are related to the modern grapes that we eat and use to make wine today. The next time you are eating a juicy olive or munching on a sweet grape, think about how these products represent the culmination of thousands of years of plant domestication. And if they are imported, chances are these products were brought to you on a boat, just as they were thousands of years ago. Okay, so I hope you guys liked my little video about ancient shipwrecks, but let me dive on in and tell you lots more about the underwater world. Well, first, let me tell you about boats in the past. Up until the 1800s, all boats you would ever find were made out of wood. So a lot of what we find when we excavate ancient shipwrecks today are these wooden bits of what we call hull structure. So the hull is the biggest part of the boat. It's what the whole boat is made out of, bits of wood. So as you can see in these two images, we find lots of bits of wood underwater that have survived. We often find wood underwater if the ship sank into a nice soft, muddy or sandy bottom and is protected from these little beasties and critters that like to eat wood underwater. They're called Teredo nivalis. And we don't like those little worms because they eat the ancient wood of the ships that I'm trying to study. One thing that I don't do is I usually don't work on modern wrecks with a big metal hull, wrecks like the Titanic that everybody thinks of. Now these are really cool, but that's just not what I study in particular. What I study are very, very ancient shipwrecks. For example, I work on samples from one shipwreck called the Ulu Barun. This shipwreck was found off the coast of Turkey and it sank so, so long ago, around 1300 BCE. When we were excavating the wreck, we found tons of beautiful, beautiful objects on it, some of which are shown here in this slide. We found agate beads that were probably part of a beautiful necklace. We also found amber beads that came all the way from the Baltic down to Turkey to be traded. We also found hundreds of these lumps of glass. Big lumps of glass and metal are called ingots. And here is a picture of the glass ingots that were found on the wreck. They were colored a beautiful, beautiful blue, almost the exact same color as the beautiful seawater in which they were found. We also found a gold scarab from ancient Egypt with the name Nefertiti written on it and lots of really, really cool treasure. It was also carrying ivory in the form of elephant ivory and hippopotamus tusks. This is one of my favorite shipwrecks and I get to analyze samples taken from this shipwreck in my laboratories at the British Museum. Another thing that I'm really interested in studying though is what people ate and drank in the ancient world. Ancient people were just like us, that they would wanna get up in the morning and feel really hungry and have something to eat. But one thing that's different from what we do now is in the ancient world, they transported a lot of their food goods in ceramic. I know we use a lot of plastic today, like plastic Tupperwares and different things to carry our food in, but in the ancient world, they really, really liked pottery vessels. In particular, on shipwrecks, we often find a lot of these pottery vessels called amphora. Here's a picture of some of the amphora that I analyzed that were found on ancient shipwrecks. When you look at these pictures, you can see these funny little incrustations on the outside of them. And that's evidence that they were under the water where all these funny little marine organisms grew on top of them. One thing I have to recommend if you're gonna study anything is ask a lot of questions. So my first question about the shipwrecks that I study is where were the cargo items coming from? So here on this map, you can see the location of where these various shipwrecks were found in the Mediterranean. Here you can see Italy that looks like a boot and then the coast of North Africa and the island of Cyprus where three of my shipwrecks are the Kyrenia, the Mozotos, and Euronisos. So I look at the amphora that these ships were carrying, and I ask myself, 
where were these amphora coming from? Where were they made? And maybe what do they have inside? So when I looked further at that, I was able to determine that where the shipwreck sank was a very, very different place from where the amphora were made. So this started to give me some clues in my investigation as to where the shipwreck was coming from. So here you can see the map again. This time, the little square boxes are showing you where these objects came from. So in the case of the Babulya shipwreck, which sank in Croatia, which you can see is on the other side of the little boot of Italy, all of the ceramic cargo that was found on that shipwreck was made in North Africa, in modern day Tunisia, and what was ancient Carthage. If you look at the other wrecks on the other side of the map, you can see those same funny squiggly lines that are leading you from where the goods were actually manufactured and made to where the shipwreck sank. And once we start making maps like this, we can start asking really cool questions about why were people traveling to these different places? Why were they importing these goods? Maybe when they even grew some of the similar foods in their hometown. Maybe they just really liked the way that olives from that other country tasted, or they wanted to show off and show that they had been importing cool imported luxury goods from the other side of the Mediterranean. Now, what can be inside of an ancient shipwreck amphora? Most of the time, people think it's just things like grapes and wine or olive oil. Almost every time someone finds an amphora, they make that assumption it's going to be wine or olive oil. But some of the shipwrecks I work on, I have found amphora full of other stuff, which has been perfectly preserved by the marine environment. One of the reasons why I like underwater archaeology so much is that the marine environment has a tendency to preserve organic remains in a really, really cool way that otherwise these remains would be eaten by microbes, bacteria, and other animals on sites on land. So when you dive underwater and you excavate a shipwreck, you're much more likely to find cool organic remains preserved underwater. In this case, this is a real amphora from the Mozoto shipwreck that I uncovered that when I opened it up, I found it had over 2,000 olive stones inside of it, which was really cool. These olive stones are around 2,500 years old. So what else could be inside of amphora found on ancient shipwrecks? There's, it turns out there's lots and lots of stuff. They really like to transport resins in the ancient world, which were used to make incense. The ancient world was probably a pretty smelly place, so incense was really, really popular. Another thing we find inside of shipwreck amphora are other kinds of fruits like figs. We also find um, some Samian amphora that even had beef bones in them, just like this silly cow here. We also find things like almonds and olives, as I talked about, and pomegranates. So it turns out instead of just grapes and olive oil, there's actually a whole range of food items that could be inside of amphora. And a lot of my research uses molecular analysis to try to find evidence for these things that were there in the past. So one of the techniques that I really, really like to use is called DNA analysis. So you guys have probably studied this in your science classes, but I'll give you a little review. DNA is deoxyribonucleic acid. It's the genetic instructions inside of every cell of your body that tells your body what kind of proteins to make. And basically it's the building blocks of life. It's formed of what we call four nitrogenous bases called adenine, guanine, thymine, and cytosine. And then we abbreviate them as A, G, T, and C. On top of that, there's a sugar phosphate backbone that the adenine, guanine, thymine, and cytosine adhere to. And it's shown in this picture, it's kind of a fun shape like a double helix, like a little twisty, twisty bit of rope. It's rather delicate though. So when things inside that have DNA inside of them, if an organism is picked, say you pick, a, pick an olive off of an olive tree or you pick a grape off of a grapevine, the DNA inside of that grape or olive is gonna start to gently break down. All living things have DNA inside of them. 
And when I look inside of Amphora, I'm mostly looking for DNA related to plants like grapes or olives or pomegranates. So a lot of times people ask me if I'm looking for people DNA, human DNA inside of these Amphora, but that's not really what we're looking for. All creatures, great and small, have DNA inside of their cells. So I'm able to study a wide range of creatures, animals, fruits and vegetables, all based on their DNA that they leave behind. So in case you guys want to know how to become an underwater archaeologist and an archaeological scientist, I thought I would give you some tips. Number one, you got to study hard in school. Learning about scientific research can be really, really fun and really, really exciting. And I love to encourage people to study hard in school so that you can go on to learn about these scientific principles. Things like chemistry, science, and math are really important to be an archaeological scientist and to be a scuba diver, because then you can understand the world better and it become, makes you a safer diver. The other good thing to do with archaeology is learn all, all about history and try to learn as many foreign languages as you can. I can't tell you how often it's really come in handy that when I go to somewhere like Spain or Mexico, I can speak in Spanish with everyone there. It's really, really, really great. And it really fosters collaboration and communication between our teams. So study languages as much as you can. Ask questions about the world around you. Things like, how do we know that? Who first figured that out for the first time? And where did this object come from? These are all cool questions that you can do to start understanding the world around you and pursuing potentially a future as an underwater archeologist and archeological scientist. Well, thank you guys so much for your attention today. I'm gonna to go ahead and turn it back over to Vivette. Thank oh, you yeah. so much. Thank you so much for answering all of our questions. There are so many more. I feel like we could be here for hours with the questions and how rapidly they're coming in. Friends, I think you'd all agree this has been such a wonderful experience. Thank you again, Lisa, for taking the time to be with us today. And a big thank you to all the students and teachers watching. Join us next week as we celebrate Geography Awareness Week. Next Thursday, tune in to learn from young explorer E. Wen Wang, who will teach us about the importance of both art and science in communicating data and inspiring action using tools like geographic information systems, also known as GIS. So register for these events and more at natgoed.org forward slash explorer classroom. You can request a chance to be featured on screen. Fellow teachers, we've also created a new interactive guide for you to share with your students to take them on a learning journey with each of our special guests. Find the Explorer Mindset in Action Guide and Teacher Edition linked on each event registration page. Have a great day, everyone. And as always, stay curious and keep exploring. Thank you.